Where'd you hear that? The internet. And you believed it? Yeah. They can't put anything on the internet that isn't true. Where'd you hear that? The, the internet. internet. Oh, look. Here comes my date. I met him on the internet. He's a French model. Uh, bonjour. All right, so on today's Breaking the Internet, this particular video was requested. It deals with uh, Representative Katie Porter, who is a representative out of California, Democrat, and she's talking to Jamie Dimon, who is the CEO or the chief financial officer, I think. He, he's one of the big wigs, either way, at J.P. Morgan Chase. Anyway, so she's questioning him. This is actually on the House floor. So we'll go ahead and look at this clip real quick. Mr. Diamond, you know how to spend $31 million a year in salary, and you can't figure out how to make up a $567 a month shortfall. This is a budget problem you cannot solve. You're an expert on financial statements, and you run a $2.6 trillion bank. I know you're good at numbers, and you've shared lots of opinions recently about how the U.S. should budget its resources, how families should budget their resources. And so I'd like to ask for your help on a problem. I went to Monster.com, and I found a job in my hometown of Irvine at J.P. Morgan Chase. It pays $16.50 an hour. Um, and so I wondered if I could, um, if you'd indulge me, um, would you do the math on this and you do the $16.50 out at 40 hours a week for 52 weeks a year, it comes out to an income of $35,070. Now this bank teller, her name is Patricia. She has one child who's six years old. She claims the one dependent after tax. She has $29,000. $100. We divide that by 12. She rents a one-bedroom apartment. She and her daughter sleep together in the same room. In Irvine, California, that average one-bedroom apartment is going to be $1,600. She spends $100 on utilities. Take away the $1,700, and she has net $725. She's like me. She drives a 2008 minivan and has gas. $400 for car expenses and gas. Net 325. The Department of Agriculture says a low cost food budget, that is ramen noodles, a low food budget is $400. That leaves her $77 in the red. She has a cricket cell phone, the cheapest cell phone she can get for $40. She's in the red $117 a month. She has after school childcare because the bank is open during normal business hours. That's $450 a month. That takes her down to negative $567. Per month. My question for you, Mr. Diamond, is how should she manage this budget shortfall while she's working full time at your bank? I don't know. I have to think about that. Would you recommend that she take out a JP Morgan Chase credit card and run a deficit? I don't know. I'd have to think about it. Would you recommend that she overdraft at your bank and be charged overdraft fees? I don't know. I'd have to think about it. So I know you have a lot I'd of. I'd love to call up and have a conversation about her financial affairs and if we can be helpful. See if you can find a way for her to live on less than the minimum that I've described. Just be helpful. Well, I appreciate your desire to be helpful, but what I'd like you to do is provide a way for families to make ends meet so that little kids who are six years old living in a one-bedroom apartment with their mother aren't going hungry at night because they're $567 short from feeding themselves, clothing them. We allow no money for clothing. We allow no money for school lunches. We allow no money for field trips, no money for medical, no money for prescription drugs, nothing. And she's short $567 already. Mr. Diamond, you know how to spend $31 million a year in salary, and you can't figure out how to make up a $567 a month shortfall. This is a budget problem you cannot solve. All right, so a couple of things that you need to know with this. First of all, and this is important because it seems as though this is a hypothetical. And so there's a little bit of a bait and switch going on because what you'll see is She'll say, I went to monster.com and I found a job. And so she's setting up a hypothetical. She's saying, I went and did some research and found one of the jobs at your bank. And then she throws in all these details with her having a, you know, what her rent is going to be and uh, uh, having a child. And she's like, well, I looked up the rent. This isn't the budget of a real person. I don't know if she's using a real person that actually exists that happens to work at his bank and just sort of making up what her numbers would theoretically be, or she's just making up a fictitious person. But either way, she's not dealing with real numbers or a real situation. She is putting up a hypothetical with numbers that she found on the internet. Now, I'm not questioning whether or not her numbers are right. I'm not sure exactly how that would have come about, but it's important to understand that she's dealing with a hypothetical because she's not suggesting there is a person that is living with a $500 deficit and going in the red every single month 
because how would that person even continue to survive and get food? And so you have to remember that, first of all, that we're not actually dealing with a person that, that actually is doing this and somehow managing to do so. So uh, I'm not saying that all hypotheticals are bad or that they're not useful. I'm just saying let's not present them as though they are real because that's where the bait and switch comes in. So what, first of all, she does is she admits that she's setting up a hypothetical using numbers that she found on the internet, but then she tries to, because she's trying to get that emotional pull, she's trying to get you to be worried about the real people involved in the situation, she either makes up a name or uses the name of somebody that works at the bank that doesn't actually use those numbers and doesn't actually have that budget. She uses that to try to create that emotional pull to think, oh, well, there's this poor single mother with a six-year-old and they're starving to death because this man's only paying... Six sixteen fifty an hour, which by the way is significantly more than the fifteen dollars an hour the Democrats say is the bare minimum that is the living wage that everybody has to be able to have to survive. Um, Talib has already called Rashida Talib has already called for a twenty dollar minimum wage. There have been other Democrats that have done this. So like the second that they get the fifteen dollar minimum wage, they're immediately going to go to well, how are they supposed to live on fifteen dollars an hour? We have to go to twenty. We have to go to twenty five. Why not make it you know fifty? 80, a thousand, a million. Like, that's the thing. They're basically using play money here. Because increasing the amount, the raw dollar amount that a person receives does not increase their wealth. Because after maybe a year or two, after the economy's adjusted, they wind up in exactly the same situation with the same amount of buying power that they had before the legally required minimum wage hike. And it actually does result in a loss of jobs and hastens the automation and innovation that winds up taking those jobs. And so there's a myriad of reasons why this is a bad idea. But chiefest among them is that they're trying to make the case that well, we have to raise these people's wage to $15 an hour because it's the only way they can survive. And the first opportunity they get, they take somebody that's making $16.50, a company that is offering more than what the Democrats say is the, is the minimum wage that you need to offer, and they're chastising them, calling them greedy, and saying, you know, you don't understand. People can't live on this. They're never going to be satisfied. And this shows that aspect of their ideology. And third, and this is the really big one, her premise is completely flawed. And part of the reason you cannot reach a correct conclusion here is because you do not have a correct premise. Because the argument is doomed right out of the gate if your premise is flawed. Because when you apply for a job, you don't ask how adding that salary impacts the company's budget or profit margin. You don't do that. Why? Because you're in it for yourself. And there's nothing wrong with that. When you go into a job interview, you don't sit down and go, you know, I'm really interested in how adding me to the team and having to pay my salary, I'm really interested in how that's going to affect the company's profit and, and bottom line. Like, is that going to help the company? Is it going to hurt the company? You don't ask those questions. And for the same reason, the company doesn't ask you, so with the amount that we're paying, uh, are you going to be able to pay your water bill? Are you going to be able to, you know, afford a, a nicer car? They don't ask you those questions because that's not part of the negotiation. What happens is both parties go in probably wanting more than they're actually going to get. The company wants you for cheaper than, than, than you want to work for. You want more money for your work than they're going to offer. And then you wind up compromising and meeting somewhere in the middle. Now, sometimes that compromise is met before you even walk in the door, like you saw the, you saw the uh, job application, you saw how much it was going to pay, and you said, you know what, I would do that job for that amount of money, and you applied and wound up getting an interview. But my point is, whether you do it that way or you wind up in a negotiation, you come to a mutually beneficial agreement. Because you want the money to do whatever you want to with it, and the company really doesn't care how you spend it. And then the reverse of that is, that you don't really care how they use your labor. You just say, I will do X for X amount of dollars. And that's how it goes. That's, that's a free market system. Two people engaging in a mutually beneficial agreement voluntarily. 
And no, not everybody's going to get what they want, but it's the fairest system that we have. Because it's impossible to provide every want of every person. And so the idea that the job or the employer ought to be worried about that person. Now, I'm not saying that you as a boss or you as a person can't be compassionate and be worried about that. And I've even had bosses that, just to be frank, uh, they were in a situation and I was in a job and they said, you know what, you really need to leave. They're like, not that I want you to leave. I'm happy that you're here. I'm glad you're a part of the team, but you need to do what's right for you. That wasn't in the interest of the company. But on a personal level, you can do that. But the company cannot be worried about that. And so you have to keep that in mind. Your salary reflects the value of your labor to that company. They're not charities, and they're not there to provide work for people. That's not the business of a company. The business of the company is to make money. And so because of that, you have to make the case, if you want more money, that your labor is more valuable to that company than what they are paying you, and that if they refuse to meet that demand, then you will take your services somewhere else. You see, nothing nothing increases your bargaining power with how much you get paid than a robust job market. And having the skills that are marketable to other employers, competitors of them, that they have to say, uh, do we really want Frank going to the other company? Because uh, he's kind of a pretty big asset, so maybe we should throw a little extra cheddar his way to try to keep him there. Like that, being good at your job, and adding value to the company, that gives you bargaining power. And so if you want to make more than is being offered, you need to be able to make the case to the company that that's what's going to happen. And if they refuse to meet those demands, and your labor really is more valuable than they're paying you, then you will be able to make that case to another employer that will be happy to pay that for you to have that added value. And so that's the thing that they're ignoring here. If you ever have a job where they are required to pay you more than the value that they add, that is added to their company, in other words, their ability to make profit, well, then you're no longer an employee. They can't take a loss on somebody. They have to be making money off of you, or otherwise they can't continue to employ you. That's part of the reason that you're seeing in a lot of the service industries automation take over because they've gotten so ridiculous with a lot of these minimum wage laws. And I'm not saying it's the only contributing factor, but it is a significant one that you get to the point that, well, the robots, even though they're expensive, they're still cheaper than paying a salary for somebody. And so that's the thing that is being completely ignored here. And then another thing is that all... Uh, any company that has paid employees, they always pay the employee what the employees felt they needed as opposed to the value of their labor. If they did that, if they did that, then there would be zero jobs. Because if the employees could just walk in and say, look, this is what I need. These are the things that I want. And this is what is going to work for me. If every business just said, you know what? You set your own salary. Every business would go out of business. There would be no jobs. I'm not saying that companies have to be heartless and not care about people, because obviously I, I don't want to work at a place like that. I get that. But to suggest that a company is that, especially one that's offering $16.50 an hour, to suggest that that is what a company is doing because they don't ask every single little detail or they don't adjust a salary to be more exorbitant, more expensive for them to meet the needs of the employer, that's unrealistic. For the same reason that you wouldn't go into your boss's office and say, you know what, the company's struggling, it's been a real rough year, I'm just going to go ahead and give myself a pay cut. I'm going to take less money so that the company can profit more off of me. You wouldn't do that. Now, you may unfortunately be told that if they, they have to do some kind of salary cut or something, and I know that that's Terrible, and that does happen, but you know, that happens in a market. But my point is, you're not going to go to them and try to do that. And in the same way, they're not going to go to you and say, All right, um, we know that you're doing the exact same amount of work that you have been forever, and uh, you're not really adding any value to the company, but um, we're just going to increase your pay just for the heck of it. 
Like that's an unrealistic business model. You should be paid a, a good wage for the value that you add to the company. I'm in favor of that. But a company can't just set salary levels to fit your needs. First of all, it'd be unfair. Like, let's say you've got the same job as a guy, uh, somebody like me, a single person, has the exact same job as a guy with eight kids. Well, I mean, I feel for the guy with eight kids, but I don't think that just because he has eight kids that he ought to be getting paid more than me if we're doing the same amount of work. Now, I think that that guy probably needs a higher paying job <laughs> if he's got to feed eight kids. But my point in all that is I don't think that a person a person's salary cannot be based on their needs. It's, it has to be based on the needs of the company so that they can reach a mutually beneficial agreement. And then this is the final part of it. Let's review the budget because I question some of the numbers that were used in this. First of all, nobody's asking the questions of why this is her budget. Because that would be the first question that I would ask. Why is she living in a $1,600 apartment if it's just her and one kid? Now, I get that she said, well, this is a one-bedroom apartment. Yeah, maybe it is in California, but I had a condo with three bedrooms, a huge living room, and a fully furnished kitchen, and it only cost me about $1,350 a month in Auburn which is a pretty nice, very quickly growing area. And it was super nice. And it was less expensive than her rinky-dink one-bedroom apartment in California. Now, here's the thing. I'm not saying that it's not. I'm not saying that she's making up the numbers because it probably actually is that expensive to live in California. But what I'm saying is she always has the option of going to a different state, a red state where they don't tax the mess out of people and the cost of living is significantly lower. She has the option to do that. And so one question that we have to ask is, why is she choosing to live in one of the most expensive areas in the country if she's having budget problems? Surely she could find a job somewhere else that will pay better and she'll be able to afford much more for her and her daughter. And, you know, that that's one thing that we should ask is that, it seems to me that the areas in the country that have far less taxation are far more affordable and offer more opportunities than living in California like she is right now. So the first question is, why is she choosing to live in an area that has such an insanely high cost of living? The second is, why is she paying $450 a month child care? That, to me, is a big red flag because one of two things is happening here. Either she has moved off to California away from family, friends, neighbors, church, all of those things, so that she can live in Southern California in a blue state that taxes the mess out of her. Either that has happened, or she's living in that city because those things are nearby. In other words, her relatives are nearby, or she has a church that she wants to go to that's nearby, something like that. Something is keeping her there, and that's the reason she hasn't moved if we were talking about a real person here, to a place that has a more affordable, more reasonable cost of living. Well, if she is staying there for her family, relatives, church, whatever, it seems to me like they ought to be helping with the child care. Have them stay with a relative, somebody that's retired. Have them stay with church. I know that there are several churches that offer things like that and, and do so either at an extremely low price or for free completely. And so that's another giant red flag that just seems completely out of place for what we're talking about here. Um, I have personally babysat for a mom that worked at a hotel with me that just could not afford a babysitter. And I did it for free. And I know that that's a really sweet deal that not a lot of people get. But, you know, my point is people find a way to make it work. And the idea that she is doing this and going, I mean, that freeing up that $450, figuring out a workaround for that, that almost takes care of her budget shortfall that Representative Porter is trying to present. It's not quite $500, but that $450 is a big chunk of it. And then here's another one. This is a perfect example of why all the things that on the social side that the left advocates for sexual promiscuity, 
uh, the breakdown of the family, all of those things, why that's a bad idea. Because even if you're going with this hypothetical, you know what would really help the situation? Having a second income because the woman is married to a husband. This is part of the reason that traditional family values that are often stomped upon by the left are actually best. They're not just best from a moral perspective, even though they are, they're also best from an economic perspective as well. Even to this day, the single biggest economic factor in whether or not a, uh, a family is financially stable is, are the mother and father together? That's the number one thing. There are other factors that go into it too, and there's certainly even married couples that still live in poverty. That happens. But it's the number one deciding factor as to whether or not that family lives in poverty is, are the mom and dad both in the house and both working? If the answer is yes, typically they may not necessarily be rich, but they're usually not in poverty either. So that's another big thing, that it's her party's policies and social agenda that is actually contributing to the downfall of this budget. But, you know, that, that is just a side note. And this is the big one. Why is it that she just really quickly glossed over? You'll notice that the only expense that got almost no time, no recognition in this video was what? Taxes. She wanted to talk all day about her housing. Wanted to talk all day about the food. Wanted to talk all day about her car payments and everything else. What she didn't want to talk about was the taxation that she just took right off the top. So even using Representative Porter's numbers, one of her biggest expenses that fixes the budget shortfall is the taxes from the state and federal government. And remember that her taxes are pretty high because she lives in a very blue state. I mean, they're high regardless because the federal income tax is ridiculous as well. But the point is, living in a blue state, that's going to be an even bigger one. So she's paying $5,970 a year, or if you're going to break that down into monthly payments, $498 per month. Well, if she's not paying taxes, that almost immediately takes care of that budget deficit that she's talking about here. And the taxes are going to be 17% of her annual budget, according to Porter's own numbers, and that is her second biggest expense, even more than her food costs. Think about that. This woman in this hypothetical that she's giving is, in her own estimation, spending more on taxes than food. And yet her party is the, the, the party of taxation. The party of let's raise taxes, the ones that were opposing the tax cuts in the last go-round. It's just astounding to me that she pretends as though that's not a factor. She just glosses over it and just doesn't pay attention to it, goes straight to the expenses and comes up with this budget deficit. Well, you know what would really help her out and pretty much solve that problem like that? Not paying taxes. And it just amazes me that they gloss over that that way. California taxes would also mean that she'd have to make because she's living in California and because of the tax burden, she would have to make $21.50 an hour, or, you know, if we're talking in annual terms, $44,000 more a year to make up that $572 deficit. So in other words, he would have to increase her pay substantially, not just a little raise, to make up $500 a month deficit. He would have to increase her pay by $44,000 to give her a $500 and 42 uh, sorry $500 and 70 uh, $572 raise that's how much she would have to increase her pay to get her take home pay enough to cover those expenses because of the crazy taxes provided by the federal government and the state of California which means you need a $9,000 a year raise to make $6,700 more. That's absurd. And I tell you what I would do if I were this guy. If this representative of the federal government, an entity that is taking nearly $6,000 from this hypothetical woman a year, 
if they're taking $6,000 of it and I'm the person providing over $35,000 to this person a year, because if she's not my employee, she's either working for somebody else or she's not working. This man is the one responsible in this hypothetical situation for giving the woman $35,000 a year in exchange for her labor. And the woman that is taking $6,000 a year from her is saying, why does this woman not have enough money? See, if I were that guy, I would turn it around. I was like, uh, because you people are taxing the mess out of her and taxing the mess out of the surrounding businesses, housing facilities that are causing those prices of li- that cost of living to go up. That's why she can't afford things for her and her daughter. Turn it back around on her. Don't go on defense. You see, I'm not saying that that would be a, you know, a, a magic solution, but this woman would be really more than adequate in providing for her own daughter if you just decrease the cost of living by stopping taxing the mess out of everything in California and stop taxing her directly. It just absolutely blows my mind that the person that is providing work for her, providing $35,000 a year, is the one blamed for the budget shortfall when the person doing the blaming and pointing the fingers is taking 6000 bucks from her a year. That is the height of liberal hypocrisy. Normally, this is the part of the video where you would expect me to ask you to like the video and subscribe to the channel. But the truth is, I don't really care whether you do or not. In fact, you know what? Don't subscribe. It's not like there's a lot of really important stuff going on in the world in the state of Alabama that you should probably be aware of. So, yeah, go ahead and subscribe. Or don't. I don't really care. Reverse psychology. Boom.